Hi, I'm Dr. Carrie Dunbar, an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and the Dallas VA Medical Center. I'd like to talk to you about a review article that I wrote with Dr. Stuart Speckler from the Mayo Clinic Proceedings entitled Controversies in Barrett's Esophagus. Studies suggest that about 5% of adults in Western countries have Barrett's esophagus, which is the major risk factor for esophageal adenocarcinoma, which has increased sevenfold in incidence in the past several decades in the United States. The history of Barrett's esophagus has been one of persistent controversy and disagreement among experts regarding the pathogenesis, management, and even the very definition of this disorder. New techniques for eradicating Barrett's esophagus have intensified some of these debates over the last few years. Our report highlights some of the current controversies confronted by the physicians and surgeons taking care of patients with Barrett's esophagus. The first controversy addressed is the very definition of Barrett's esophagus. We suspect Barrett's during endoscopy when we see salmon-colored or pink mucosa extending above the GE junction, and we take biopsies to confirm the diagnosis. There's been disagreement in the Barrett's world about whether the histologic finding of intestinal metaplasia with its distinctive goblet cells is required for diagnosis of Barrett's, or whether any columnar epithelium, such as cardiac epithelium, should be considered Barrett's esophagus. Some studies suggest that cardiac epithelium predisposes to adenocarcinoma, while other large studies have not shown an increased risk of cancer unless intestinal metaplasia is present. At this time, U.S. GI societies require intestinal metaplasia with goblet cells to be present for a diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus, but the British Society of Gastroenterology did not. The second controversy addressed is whether endoscopic surveillance of Barrett's esophagus prevents esophageal cancer and whether surveillance should be performed. After Barrett's esophagus is diagnosed, current guidelines call for regular surveillance endoscopy with biopsies to look for dysplasia so that it can be treated before it progresses to cancer. However, Recent estimates of cancer risk in Barrett's esophagus are considerably lower than the previous estimates, and the risk of cancer in non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus also appears to decrease over time. Some observational studies have suggested that surveillance may detect tumors in an earlier stage and improve survival, but other more recent studies suggest that surveillance does not prevent death from esophageal cancer in patients with Barrett's esophagus. There is an ongoing randomized controlled trial in the United Kingdom that addresses the effectiveness of surveillance for Barrett's esophagus, but results are not expected for several years. Despite the limitations of surveillance endoscopy, it is the current standard of care recommended by most GI societies, and we feel it should continue to be offered to patients with Barrett's esophagus. The next controversy addresses who should be screened for Barrett's esophagus. Until recently, endoscopic screening for Barrett's esophagus was suggested for virtually all patients with chronic GERD symptoms. Today, however, the most recent guidelines from the GI societies and the American College of Physicians recommend endoscopic screening only for patients who have chronic GERD and at least one additional risk factor for esophageal adenocarcinoma, such as age greater than 50 years, male gender, white race, hiatal hernia, an elevated body mass index, intra-abdominal body fat distribution, nocturnal reflux symptoms, and tobacco use. However, in studies of patients with esophageal adenocarcinoma, about 40% don't report any GERD symptoms, so these patients will be missed using our current screening guidelines. Considering the alarming rise of the frequency of esophageal adenocarcinoma and the lack of definitive data regarding the benefits of screening and surveillance, at this time, we suggest adherence to the current guidelines. The last set of controversies we discuss relates to the patients with Barrett's esophagus who should be treated with endoscopic eradication therapy. Until recently, when endoscopic screening or surveillance revealed high-grade dysplasia in Barrett's esophagus, the standard treatment was esophagectomy. In recent years, endoscopic techniques such as radiofrequency ablation and endoscopic mucosal resection have been used to treat high-grade dysplasia successfully and with far fewer complications than surgery. Ablation of low-grade dysplasia is somewhat more controversial, largely due to difficulties in establishing the diagnosis. At this time, the GI societies recommend endoscopic eradication therapy as the treatment of choice for most patients with high-grade dysplasia and they recommend either endoscopic ablation or intensive surveillance for low-grade dysplasia. Especially controversial is the issue of ablation of patients with non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus. Before recommending this practice, clinicians should appreciate that the rate of progression to cancer with non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus is very low, and the efficacy of radiofrequency ablation and the other endoscopic therapies and further reducing this risk of cancer hasn't been proven. Ablation generally requires several endoscopic procedures to achieve complete eradication with considerable cost and there is some risk of complications. Another consideration is subsquamous intestinal metaplasia, also known as buried Barrett's, which can occur after ablation and cases of subsquamous cancer have been reported after the ablative therapies. 
also Barrett's metaplasia recurs relatively frequently after ablation, with some studies describing a recurrence in about one-third of patients at two years. And therefore, ablation of non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus does not obviate endoscopic surveillance at this time. At this time, the available data strongly support the use of endoscopic eradication therapy for high-grade dysplasia and perhaps even for low-grade dysplasia. For non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus, with so many unanswered questions, more research is needed to determine whether endoscopic ablation prevents cancer before it can be widely recommended. So in summary, Barrett's esophagus is a common disorder that continues to spark discussion and debate at medical conferences and in the literature. Ongoing research to improve risk stratification, such as the use of molecular markers, and improved imaging may help address some of these controversies in the future. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayocliniceproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.com. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.